Galatians from the Apostle Paul. And uh, we're going to continue this morning just giving some uh, more background on the city of Ephesus. And also, I want to tell you some more about John Calvin because we're going to be using his um, sermons on Ephesians to help teach us Ephesians. So um, anyway, that's where we're headed this morning. Let's pray and get started. Father, we ask your blessing on us this morning as we come to your word once again. We pray that this study that we're embarking on and of this uh, letter to the Christians in Ephesus would, uh, well, that your spirit would take it and teach us and, and increase our faith, increase our love for you, and uh, sanctify us. We pray that this study would do, uh, give you praise and honor, and we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, then. Uh, let's read just the first uh, few verses here of Paul's opening. Ephesians chapter 1. All right. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things in earth. All right, well, um, let's start off then this morning by learning a little bit more about Ephesus and the place and times when these people that Paul is writing to um, lived. Now, Remember, last time we looked up uh, quite a number of references to Ephesus in the New Testament, and we saw that um, it, it uh, figured into the Apostle Paul's ministry quite significantly. Um, it's mentioned a lot. Paul spent three years there teaching, and, and uh, it... <laughs> There were riots there as a result of the gospel. There's tremendous persecution there. And uh, so let's see, let's see just how significant of a city that was and also see that it was, in fact, significant as a stronghold of Satan as well. So here we go. Maybe that's why Paul spent so much time there. The city. Oh, and this is from uh, Kistemacher's commentary on Revelation, and the reason he talks about Ephesus is because that's the first church of Asia, Ephesians chapter two, that Christ has John write a letter to, to the church at Ephesus, and so in this commentary on Revelation, Kistemacher talks about. Ephesus. The city of Ephesus had a varied history that went back centuries before Paul's letter was, at, or John's letter, was addressed to the church that thrived within its walls. Riches gathered from commerce and religion, ah, riches from religion, interesting, enabled Ephesus to rebuild a temple destroyed by a fire. 
This temple was, it was dedicated to the goddess Artemis, A-R-T-E-M-I-S. And in, for the Romans, it was the same goddess, only they called her Diana. And was served by countless priests and priestesses. So it was kind of a Rome and the Pope type place in a way. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. The Ephesians constructed a theater that could seat an estimated 24,000 people. The city may have accommodated a population in excess of 200,000. Ramsey called Ephesus a city of change because the Caster River, along which it was located, silted and eventually made its harbor useless. This proved to be a setback to the commercial interests of the city where the traffic of the land met the traffic of the sea. But throughout the first century after Christ, Ephesus continued to be an immense trading center, especially of religious artifacts, and to a degree an administrative center for the Roman government. You see, begin to see again why Paul spent so much time there. In addition, Ephesus had a temple built to further the imperial religion of Rome. The city dedicated the temple of the, this is Sebastoi, S-E-B-A-S-T-O-I. That was a, the family of some of the Caesars, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian. Uh, so the city dedicated that temple to essentially the Roman Caesar gods, right? In A.D. 90, and as was customary in appointed temple wardens, keepers of the temple, for the worship of the emperor. In Ephesus, the relationship between the worship of Artemis and the state religion of Rome <clears throat> was very close. Further, Roman officials forced the people to worship the emperor Domitian and to utter the statement, <clears throat> uh, how's this go, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. Christians were unwilling to place Caesar above Christ, for they uttered the motto, Jesus is Lord. As a result, as you can well guess, they suffered persecution. Christianity is exclusive. It allows no compromise with other religion, <clears throat> religions. In the latter part of the first century, it was on a collision course with Rome, which at first had allowed the Christians protection under the umbrella of the Jewish religion. It was initially regarded as just kind of a subset of Judaism. But when the Roman authorities realized that Christianity was different from Judaism and that it would not deviate from the teachings of Christ, they were no longer tolerant of Christians. They could not understand that these people separated themselves from the world to be a completely dissimilar society. Indeed, they were so abhorred, the, or indeed, they, the Romans, so abhorred the absolutism of this new religion that they sought to eliminate it by demanding observance of emperor worship. But the Christians rejected even a token of obedience to the state religion because they accepted no rival to Jesus Christ. Numerous sources reveal that for centuries the temple of Artemis was declared a place of refuge for anyone who had committed a crime. Even parts of the city were at one time given to the status of asylum. For instance, the area abutting the temple grounds even gave impunity to the criminal. At the time that John wrote Revelation in A.D. 95, the inner parts of Artemis' temple were a safe haven for any thief, robber, slave trader, and plunderer of a temple. The level of morality among the city's population was notoriously low. The people were licentious, 
superstitious, vile, and violent. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus, a resident of Ephesus, purportedly commented that, quote, the morals of the temple were worse than the morals of beasts, for even promiscuous dogs don't mutilate each other. The Jewish residents in the city seem to be numerous, rich, and influential. They had established a Jewish community whose residents may have enjoyed the privilege of Roman citizenship. They'd built their synagogue with legal protection from Rome to observe their own religion, including the keeping of the Sabbath. Although when Paul first came to Ephesus, they welcomed the teaching of Christ, Acts chapter 18, they soon rejected it, and in time they became violently hostile to Christianity. Yet Paul labored there for three years with positive results among both Jews and Greeks. He sent a letter to the church in Ephesus, probably in 62 AD, during his Roman imprisonment. After his release, he visited Ephesus, where Timothy had become the pastor. John, also, John took up residence there. Oh, I read that wrong. Also, John, the Apostle John, took up residence there and proved to be an influential force. I think I read somewhere that, remember, Christ committed his mother Mary to John's care um, at the cross, and so somebody mentioned that uh, it's thought that John and Mary took up residence there. But during the concluding years of Emperor Domitian's reign, the last part of the 90s, right, the pressure on the church increased because of emperor worship, with the result that John was banished to the island of Patmos. All right, so there's some good background. And also, you know, not only was there that um, the state religion of Rome and its temple, but there was also, uh, and, and the, that idol idolatrous uh, temple of Artemis, but you also, we also learn in, in Acts that there was all kinds of uh, satanic uh, magic, right? Lots of occult practices. Remember, it's a, a lot of the people that practiced those things repented of it. Some of them did, and, and then they burned, they burned all of their magic books and so on. So Ephesus, here's the point. Ephesus was... A every bit as much of a satanic earthly capital as Rome as Rome was. And so it's no wonder that Paul experienced the things that he did there and that he spent so much so much time there. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, and isn't that interesting that uh, um, Kistemacher said that religion was uh, not only was there trade because there was a harbor there, right? And so people would bring their goods and commerce and, and so forth, back and forth. But remember, he, he also noted that there was also the economy of religion there. So, uh, you know, when the riot started in, in the book of Acts there at Ephesus, you know, great is Artemis and so on, and they're all rioting. And, and it, it actually started over uh, the gospel's threat to economics, right? Because all these silversmiths and people were, were they were making all these images and, and Artemis trinkets to sell. They were selling them, making their, their livelihood off of it. This was, this was big business. And you can bet people came and donated money and so forth and a big priesthood there and, and all that stuff going on. It's just kind of a replay of, or a predecessor of what we see in Rome today, what Martin Luther saw when he took his, his trip to, uh, to Rome. So anyway, the point being that so often the real motivating factor, a real motivating factor behind false religion, and this includes fake 
Christianity is money. Money. That's what it that's what it's all about. So all right then. So what we've got here is as I said, I wanted to familiarize you some more with John Calvin because uh well well initially our our, our immediate reason is because as I said we're going to be uh, drawing on a lot uh, from John Calvin's sermons on Ephesians, which are extremely insightful, very, very good. And uh, as we, you know, he, so John Calvin's going to help us study Ephesians, or we might even say he's going to teach us Ephesians. Well, uh, you know, you may know that uh, John Calvin wrote the uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion, okay? It's, uh, the print here is fairly small. I haven't read this. I've only read part of this so far, but it's a, it's a big book, and, and it's a little bit daunting. It actually, of course, it's not superficial at all, but it actually isn't that difficult to understand. This is a pretty good edition of it, uh, Hendricks and Publishers, uh, they they publish this thing, and uh, <clears throat> it's it's a uh, the probably I get probably the first thorough, comprehensive, systematic theology you might say, of uh, Christian doctrine of, bib- of biblical biblical doctrine. So uh, let me just uh, introduce you to Calvin here, if. If you have a negative view of John Calvin, you need to get your head put on straight. <laughs> because and I and I hope that our study here will will help you will help you do that. Um, so <clears throat> here we go. Background and youth. John Calvin had a relative short life. Let's see, he lived. He only lived till he was 55, and then he he died. Um, He stands along Martin Luther as the most notable of the 16th century, 1500s, reformers. So John Calvin lived from 1509 to 1564. He was a Frenchman, um, and uh, so his... His fr- French real name was Jean, J-E-A-N, and uh, we, but we know him as <clears throat> John Calvin. Let's listen to what this uh, little short bio has to say here. John Calvin didn't write much about his early years, but in some ways his family situation set the stage for his later life. He was born in Noyon, that's N-O-Y-O-N, Noyon, France, a Catholic cathedral town northeast of Paris. Noyon, that's kind of interesting, they they spelled it differently here. Anyway, Noyon had been a hub of religious and political activity for centuries, seeing the crowning of Pepin the Short, if you've studied church history or history, Pepin the Short, uh, that's way back, 752 A.D., and the consecration of Charlemagne in 768 A.D. John Calvin was the second of seven sons, two of whom died as children. They were born to Gerard, oh, here's his his name, Calvin, C A U V I N. That's the French name. So Jean Calvin, something like that. Anyway, uh, so his parents were Gerard and, and Gerard's first wife, Jean Lafranc, the daughter of a local innkeeper. And the children, she must have died uh, by a second wife that Gerard fathered uh, two daughters from. <clears throat> the son of a boatman, Gerard received an education and served as a Noyon cathedral business administrator and lawyer. Okay, so John Calvin was born 
big time, deep into the Roman Catholic um, edifice. Having some influence, this is his father, having some influence in the church then, Gerard array, arranged incomes for his sons, kind of scholarships, I guess, essentially funding their education. At age of 14, John, at his father's bidding, went to Paris in pursuit of a Latin and theological education, all right, a, a career to, what, the priesthood uh, in the church, and to flee the plague that was going on in Noyon at the time. Some people have attributed John Calvin's lifetime of poor health, migraines, and digestive distress to harsh conditions and bad food in college. But when disagreements between Gerard, his father, and his clerical employers in the church resulted in Gerard's dismissal from the Roman church, interesting, huh? He urged John to change his career pursuits and study law instead of theology. A dutiful son, in 1528, John went to Orleans and then to, I don't even know how to pronounce these French names, Bourges, B-O-U-R-G-E-S, earning a doctorate of law. That, that's an interesting note because, you know, Martin Luther also studied law, and so did John Calvin. Anyway, and he learned Greek on the side. In law school, though largely a humanist, he, he wasn't a Christian at the time. He wasn't born again, right? He maintained an interest in theology, reading works of reformers older than himself, such as Martin Luther, who had been excommunicated in 1521, and also... Or Ulrich Zwingli, uh, and he was a Swiss, I think, uh, and making friends among those who sympathize with the German reformers, the German Lutherans. After the death of his father in 1531, John, who had Latinized his family name now from Calvin to Calvin, returned to Paris to study ancient languages, and he completed his first book, a commentary on, I guess this guy was a Roman somebody, Seneca, his treatise on clemency, published in the spring of 1532. It was considered a brilliant work, though not exactly a commercial success. He didn't make much money off it. The next two years thrust the studious Calvin into the first of many controversies. After a friend of his, Nicholas Cop, C-O-P, uh, <clears throat> stirred up controversy with a speech that included themes from the, re from the Reformers, Cop and Calvin fled Paris to avoid arrest. Calvin later said that about this time, he experienced a, quote, sudden conversion, being convicted now of the authority of the Scriptures, and sensing a personal call to obedience. And consequently, in May 1534, he returned briefly to Noyon to disengage from his church benefices, that's a, an income, scholarships, you might say, separating him from the Roman church in the most fundamental and practical sense. Okay, it's like, I don't want any more of your money, Rome, Roman Catholics, I so-called church, uh, no more. <clears throat> by, late, by late in 1534, the French king, Francis I, now himself the target of the most ardent French Protestants, was denouncing and threatening what he called the anarchist Protestants. Turning his words to action, Francis had Protestants jailed and executed. Tens of thousands are said to have been martyred with entire villages, sometimes decimated. Calvin fled France and sought refuge in the Protestant territory of Basel. That's in Switzerland. And it was in these formative years 
in his mid-20s that he also formulated the initial outline of the first basic edition of his Institutes of the Christian Religion, which was first published in Latin in 1536. And uh, one of the chief reasons that he wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion was to, and I think there's some kind of a preface, dedicatory or something at the beginning, that uh, he, uh, he, he addresses it to the king of France, Francis I. He's trying to show the king, trying to get him to stop the persecution because that uh, he's showing them that this doctrine that these Christians believe is not set to overthrow his rule, uh, but that it is, it is genuine and real Christianity. <clears throat> As summer approached in 1536, after a brief trip to Italy and back into France, Calvin and a brother and stepsister set out for the free city of Strasbourg, Austria, I guess, where Calvin expected to continue his scholarly pursuits. But strife between France and the Holy Roman Empire. I always get confused as to what the Holy Roman Empire was, but it's, uh, I think it's like centered in Austria, what would now be Austria. Um, anyway, it forced the travelers to take a serious detour through Geneva, Switzerland. In terms of the history <clears throat> of Europe, that change of route has almost biblical significance because as the gospel writer says of Jesus, he must needs go through Samaria. In the providence of God, it seemed, Calvin needed to go through Geneva. <clears throat> as the author of the Institutes, Calvin's scholastic reputation had preceded him. His books, the Institutes, had been read in Geneva. At that time, the work was presented in a basic question and answer format. He, he, he uh, updated and improved it over the years, different editions, uh, similar to Luther's little catechism. Well, news spread of his arrival in Geneva, and it prompted quick action on the part of oh, this guy named Farrell. He's another reformer, F-A-R-E-L, Guillaume, Guillaume Farrell. He lived uh, from 1489 to 1565. Farrell was a dynamic and impetuous acquaintance of Calvin's who had swayed much of French-speaking Switzerland toward Protestantism. Farrell immediately confronted Calvin. This is kind of classic here, right? He threatened Calvin with the wrath of God if Calvin did not stay in Geneva, which allied with the city of Bern, had months earlier declared itself to be Protestant, no longer under the control of a Catholic bishop. Calvin submitted to what he perceived to be God's call upon his life. So uh, this Pharaoh, he's like, God's wrath is going to come down on you if you don't stay here in Geneva and preach, all right? And Calvin per permitted, or, or submitted to what he perceived to be God's call upon his life. I was so terror-stricken, he said, that I did not continue my journey. He settled in Geneva to help lead the church and thus the city. Um, and so what you have almost kind of a city-state, city and church were not separate. You'll, you'll see that, I think, as we go on, go on here. At first, Calvin gave biblical lectures, and then he preached. For years, Geneva had maintained citizens' councils. And in 1537, Farrell and Calvin presented the city's council with governmental and ecclesiastical recommendations. What they're trying to say is, look, the, the city, the civil portion, the city needs to be um, fashioned according to biblical principles and standards, right? And some of these were adopted by the city in modified form. But opposition was brewing. 
It was fueled by the neighboring city of Bern and by the fact that Calvin was a fiery foreigner. He's a Frenchman, right? In April 1538, Farrell and Calvin were both banished from the city. Calvin at last moved then to Strasbourg, where he pastored French refugees. He lectured. He wrote a commentary on Romans. This is one of the things that you're going to see in Calvin. Uh, even though he was in ill health most of his life, his, he was massively productive in his, in his preaching and in his uh, writing and publishing and so on. Um, so he wrote a commentary, he, he pastored these, this church, he wrote a commentary on, on Romans, he revised and, up and expanded his institutes, and with the encouragement of another mentor, Martin Bucer, B-U-C-E-R, he found a wife in 1540 at age 31 after discounting several suggested prospects, Calvin married a parishioner, the church, an attractive and intelligent mother of two, and her name was Idelet, I-D-E-L-E-T-T-E, -E -E, Idelet. She was the, this is interesting, she was the recent widow of a guy named John Storder, who was an articulate Anabaptist leader. So, uh, theologically different probably in many ways from Calvin but but he had uh, he had before he died or, or, or I guess her as a widow she had joined Calvin's church uh, anyway Calvin took this the Storter children as his own there was no child born to Idolette and John and and oh no child born to Idolette and John survived infancy. Idolette died in 1549, having been ill for some time, possibly with tuberculosis, and John Calvin never remarried. So these kinds of things, you know, uh, J.C. Ryle, uh, he, he had three Y. He was widowed three times there, and then and, and many of many of these uh, people, and, and especially the people like Calvin and others that, that we know that God has used, uh, they suffered greatly. Um, all right, here now, Calvin returns to Geneva. Here we go. By 1541, so that's three years later, the political climate in Geneva had changed. The somewhat pro-Catholic burn influence had receded, and Calvin's supporters begged him to return. His strong sense of God's call on his life, as in 1536, added to his certainty of God's preordained plans and drove Calvin's response. So in September, he returned to Geneva, a gentler pastor leader, possibly tamed by Idolette, whom he called the faithful helper of my ministry. Church historian John Leth notes, quote, Luther wanted to eliminate from the life of the church everything that scripture condemned. But the Swiss, particularly earlier German Swiss reformer Zwingli, insisted that every Christian practice should have positive warrant in the scripture. I always get kind of confused uh, by this. Um, so Luther wanted to eliminate from the church everything that the Bible actively condemns, all right, that it expressly says no to, all right? Now, Zwingli, a little bit different spin on thing, said that, Every Christian practice needed to have a positive warrant in Scripture. It's not just that, well, the Bible doesn't condemn or prohibit this expressly uh, from our, our worship. And, and, uh, uh, but Zwingli said, well, that's not enough. 
it also needs to be positively authorized by Scripture. This positive concern for change, more than focus on separation from the Catholic Church, is the origin of the Reformed tradition within the Protestant tradition. While Luther's, Luther, while Luther's focus was on cleansing the church, Calvin, expanding on Zwingli's vision, took reform out into the community at large, hoping to transform society. All right. With this in mind, Calvin intended to make Geneva a model community based on biblical teaching. You know, you kind of, with us being so used to separation of church and state here, um, which, which means the state is to keep its nose out of, uh, that's what it means in, in America, out of the church. But scripturally speaking, what you've got is God has ordained and established his church. He's also or, uh, established um, the civil authorities. And they operate in two different realms. Both are supposed to be operating under his authority. So often then they don't. But Calvin, he, he wanted really he's to combine the two, right? Um, and, uh, and you could argue that, well, that's not going to work in this fallen world. And uh, anyway, under the tutelage of Martin Bucer and Strasbourg, Calvin had identified a fourfold New Testament leadership scheme. Pastor, teacher, elder, and deacon, in which he in Geneva he laid out and proposed as ecclesiastical ordinances. Now, this is what the, this becomes clearer here. Again, the city councils adopted Calvin's recommendations in an adapted form, men carrying out these four roles effect, in effect manage the city-state. So you've got, in the church, you've got pastor, teacher, elder, and deacon, but they also ran this civil aspect of Geneva, the, the city-state. Pastors, of course, performed the duties of the clergy, like preaching and administering the sacraments, providing spiritual teaching to the people. Teachers supplied education for the city's adults and children. Elders provided oversight to church and consequently also civil discipline. This is interesting here. To be excommunicated from the church was to be excommunicated from the town, right? Um, it, the, those authorities were, were combined. Um, <clears throat> so elders provided oversight to church and consequently civil discipline and were representatives from the community councils. Deacons were selected by the congregation in the church to care for the poor and also administered the hospitals in the, in the city. The local church and state issues of the time are difficult to sort out. You can imagine, right? Calvin was paid by the city council. As pastor, he was not a dictator over politically powerless people. Calvin saw distinctly separate church versus state functions, yet since the pastor spoke for God, the balance of power leaned toward the authority and opinions of the clergy, of the church. Even so, Calvin encountered severe local opposition to his reforms and what some have called his strenuous rule. Well, obviously, if a church is trying to rule over the city-state, you're trying to rule over unregenerate people, right? And, uh, and yeah, it's not going to go well. The fact that Calvin was a foreigner, he didn't become a citizen until 1559, 
added to this opposition. He was a French citizen in a Swiss city-state, a man whose high profile was drawing other foreigners, including refugees fleeing persecution in France. Protesters would then, they disrupted his preaching, firing gunshots, intimidating him with dogs, and threatening his life. But Calvin's theological certainty withstood many challenges and conflicts, including the 1551 trial of a guy named Jerome Bolsec. He was a former Catholic monk. He had become a Protestant physician. Bolsec vigorously countered Calvin's doctrine of predestination, the very underpinnings of his uh, uh, pastoral and civil authority. Bolsec was banished and later wrote a slanderous and historically destructive biography of Calvin. How are we doing on time, Verla? About 15 minutes. Okay. In 1553, as public support for Calvin again ebbed lower, his supporters were once again galvanized by the arrest, trial, and execution of Miguel Servetus, Servetus, I guess you'd say, S-E-R-V-E-T-U-S. This is an interesting one. This is how, you know, a lot of times I've heard people say, yeah, Calvin supported the execution of that guy, Servetus, right? Which he, he did, all right? But so Servetus was the author of a book that discounted the more universally accepted and fundamental doctrine of the Trinity. Servet, so in other words, he, he would be attacking him in the deity of Christ. And Servetus had been arrested when he traveled to Geneva and was later burned at the stake, though Calvin appealed for a more humane execution. So here again, you see the combination of church and state. To be a heretic in the church was to be guilty as a criminal in the, in the city-state. A prodigious letter writer, Calvin wore himself out trying to broker resolutions to theological disputes among the Protestants. On several key points, he maintained a middle ground between Lutherans, who held to the beliefs of infant baptism and the real presence of Christ in the Lord's table, and to a very liturgical worship. And then you had the Anabaptists who disavowed infant baptism, held a commemorative, symbolic uh, view of communion, and simplified their worship settings. Calvin approved of infant baptism, but said that Christ was spiritually present in the Eucharist. That would be somewhat different from the Lutherans. As pastor of three churches, Calvin encouraged vigorous congregational singing of the psalms and a combination of spontaneous and fixed prayers. Now middle-aged, Calvin was overworked with daily preaching, teaching, and writing, producing, a comprehensive, producing comprehensive biblical commentaries and other books, I think on almost the whole Bible, uh, including yet another expanded edition of the Institutes. Yet somehow he found time at age 50 to found the Geneva Academy. Its secondary school taught French, Latin, Greek, and philosophy. Its college, which became the University of Geneva, specialized in Hebrew, Greek, philosophy, arts, and theology. And that would be Protestant theology, needless to say. In terms of the history of Europe, this institution may have been Calvin's crowning achievement. Scholars from this school, taught by Calvin himself and others, spread out across Europe, in effect serving as reformed missionary disciples to France, called the Huguenots, the Netherlands, where you have the Dutch Reformed, to England, the Puritans, to Scotland, the Presbyterians, Germany, and Italy. But Calvin's weak physical condition could not maintain the pace. For the last five years of his life, until his death in 1564 at age 54, he worked through pain and sickness, 
sometimes so weak that he gave his lectures from his bed. When urged to slow down, he quipped, What? Would you have the Lord find me idle when he comes? Despite or maybe because of his international renown, Calvin requested that he be buried in an unmarked grave in a public seminary, seminary, public cemetery, his whereabouts unknown except to his maker and redeemer. In his final illness, Calvin commented on his own life. While I am nothing, yet I know that I have prevented many disturbances that would otherwise have occurred in Geneva. God has given me the power to write. I have written nothing in hatred, but always I've faithfully attempted what I believe to be for the glory of God. So there you have it. There he was, and this goes on to talk about how he was a theological giant and what the five points of Calvinism are because he did not write. Well, he believed in the five points of Calvinism. He taught them, but they weren't called the five points of Calvinism. Those didn't come up later until what we call the Synod of, of Dort uh, in, in reaction to the error, the Arminian errors. So, all right, well, we'll stop right there. And next time, then we'll actually get into, uh, we probably will only get into the first couple of verses here. Calvin is thorough, but we'll plan to pick up our study there next time. Father, we thank you for the work that you did through servants of yours like well, like these reformers, Luther and Calvin and others, and thank you that you will build your church, that the gates of hell have not and will not uh, prevail against it. And we pray, Father, that you might send more John Calvins and Luthers into uh, this world in our day, and we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.